Hello, welcome to the second session in the business series. I'm Barbara Holding from K9HSCourses.com and I'm really delighted to welcome you this evening um, and we're going to move forward from the session one that we did. So if you missed that, don't worry at all. It's on replay and you can see the whole series. But what we're looking at this evening is going to be policies for successful practice. Now, as usual, I'm home alone. I don't have anybody supporting me and reading the chat box. I don't have IT support. So it's great if you use the chat box, which is on the right of your screen. And if you could just let me know if you can hear me clearly, that would be so helpful. So anybody out there, just say you can hear me, you can see, that would be great. It's just my check that I know that I've connected up properly. Thank you, Laura. Oh, that was such a long wait. I was really panicking. Fantastic. Thank you, Vicky. So thank you, Jenny. Welcome. Really nice to have you here this evening. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to bring up the slides. Thank you, Katka, both sound and visual. That's so helpful. So just a bit of housekeeping. If this is your first time, welcome. It's fantastic to have you here. If you've been here before, you'll know your way around the page a little bit. On the right is a chat box and it's great, but it moves up as we go along. So please don't ask questions in the chat box. It's great to kind of check in, you know, say some comments, but if you've got a specific question, if you look along the taskbar along the bottom, it says, ask a question. If you click that open, you can put your question in there. And this is a really great forum because as well as um, recording the questions, they timestamp them. So if you want to listen back later to one of the questions again, you don't have to listen to the whole of the um, session. You can just timestamp and go to that question. So the other thing that's fantastic about the questions is there's upvoting. So you get to decide which is the priority question. So all you do is vote and it moves. When I come to read a question, if you could just stop um, upvoting for that moment, otherwise what happens is the question disappears off my screen and it's one of those, oh, aha moments, what do I do next? So that would be fantastic. There's also a poll. So if you look along the bottom task bar, I've put a poll in and please vote on that. It would be great. It gives me lots of information, what kind of um, useful templates or future crowdcast to develop for you or future and resources which I want to share with you. So just getting yourself orientated around there, the chat bar, if you've not said hello, please do let me know your name and where you are. It's great to see so many people back again. And I do know it's hard to give up time. We're such busy people, but it's great that you've taken the time on a Sunday evening in the summer to come and check this out because I've got lots of exciting things to share. So tonight I'm going to be looking at um, policies for successful practice. And I'm really passionate about supporting people in practice because it's such a long journey to get to that point that I want to make sure you've got longevity and that you feel supported. And so sharing these ideas and facts about the essence of what you need in place to make sure you're sustainable as well and you evolve with the times. So let's get started. Now, I've got a new IT thing here going on. You can't see it, but I can, so it's a little bit new to me. So hopefully you've got my next slide up, but I'm a bit blind at the moment. So hopefully, can you all see the slide? What is a policy? So I'm going blind. I'm going to my presentation, and I can't see you for a moment. So I have to kind of go backwards and forwards, and it's a bit of a test for me, but there you go. Linda, how are you doing that, Lynn? Watching out, out and having, um, a, while you're dog walking, you must have amazing um, Wi-Fi systems out there because you need really good Wi-Fi to see this. If it freezes, don't panic, just, just refresh. Okay, so I want to expand how important it is to have your practice policies in place. And what we're going to do is build on the practice ethos we discussed last time. So your practice ethos is your anchor and your reference point. So what's so important about the policy? Well, the policies are your professional framework. They're the framework to your practice. They're the framework to your business. So your practice ethos that we discussed and 
um, shared ideas about is your anchor point, your reference point. It's the way you choose to practice and it's your message that you're sending out to those who use your service. So you're a service provider and your policies. It's really important that you develop policies that are a framework to support that practice to make it sustainable. And you don't write policies for the sake of it. You're going to write policies to support and develop and evolve your service. So you lead the way in your area. So um, as a professional working with dogs and owners, you are accountable and you are responsible. So this framework is not just part of being a professional, but it's really important for your sustainable business as well long term. And with that, as a therapist, as a canine therapist, you bring on board clinical reasoning and critical thinking in your clinical decision making. So a policy is a system of principles to, to actually guide your decision making. Um, there are a set of rules um, and they're going to accomplish the aims that you've set for your business. And you are supported with the professional associations that you affiliate with because they usually have a code of conduct and a scope of practice. But within that, there are so many ways to do the same thing. Practice is evolving and changing. So there's so much overlap across different professionals. And to embrace that, you really need to have your policies um, in place. And your policies you set are mandatory. OK, so they empower your practice ethos. They're a statement of your professional intent in the service that you're providing. And they really help in your decision making because we are pulled and tugged by so many areas on our decision making. Um, and this is something I want to explore a little bit as we go along. I see we've got a couple of questions already. Do check out the poll, put your questions in there. I'm really happy to stop and answer the questions as we go along as well, because I think it's really important that you get an opportunity that I have a go at answering your questions. If I don't have the answer, I'll go find it out. But what we want to do is try to make this interactive so you get the, your questions answered this evening, not in a month's time. So the other thing is that you implement your policies as a protocol. So there is a difference between policies and protocol. So just moving on to the next slide. So what's the protocol? Let's have a think about it. So what the protocol is, it defines a set of procedures or steps to be followed to accomplish a set task. So let's think of canine hydrotherapy, one of my great passions. Um, we're going to have um, a, a protocol for our infection control because, you know, we've got warmth, we've got wet and we have a continual supply of pollutants. So your infection control policy and your infection control procedures are paramount to offering safe practice. Um, the idea that you can be a therapist and just do a little bit of water management on the side or whatever you really need to, if you're in hydrotherapy, you really need to develop your infection control policy and procedures so you're offering safe practice and that's really important, that's the bottom line. And then as well as safe practice, we want competent practice and so for that we need really high quality water to work in. So it's going to be based on experience as well as knowledge. So the idea that you have a set of protocols that are delivered by someone else for your practice, but they're not in your center, they're not offering your service, isn't really going to be, if they're just generic, isn't really going to solve your problems. So you do need to build your own policies because you're going to customize them for your niche service that you're offering. So the other thing is they're going to be issued to everyone in your organization. So everyone who's in your organization, who's involved in that task, whether it's a partner, a friend who helps you close down, um, whether you've got a team of staff, it needs to be in their language and it needs to be implemented to them. So it needs to be issued to them. And I actually like to discuss the protocols with them, try them out, trial them, which is really useful, and then see if we can kind of negotiate and make them the very best fit for what we need them to cover. So the other thing with your protocols is they're not set. They're not dry, they're living documents, and I'm very visual. I like to learn hands-on, I'm, I'm really visual in everything I do, so I really like to use photographs and bullet lists. They work for me, and having them laminated and up in certain areas, like in your wet room, um, plant room, is really useful as a reference point as well. 
So hopefully, is, just let me know, can you hear me? Hopefully we've got um, policies and protocols, understanding that, so your protocols, policies and procedures are all really different things. Thank you, Sarah. I'm just trying to, there we go. Got this new IT tech. I'm hoping you can see the slide really clearly as well. So let's look at standards of practice. So standards of practice are really important. They're going to include your standards of clinical practice. They're standards of your operating procedures. They're gonna be your clinical practice protocols and they're gonna be your clinical procedures. So standards of practice are going to be all encompassing, but as a, as a clinician in business, I'm going to really look at clinical and professional standards um, for a, a few slides and just discuss those. Then we'll move on to legislative and regulatory. Um, and then our specific business requirements, which are going to be very specific for each one of you, depending on the service that you provide. So standards of practice, they direct and they maintain safe and clinically competent practice. And that's really important. Um, and we're talking about canine therapy, but you can take some of these principles and put them into other businesses. But I'm looking specifically as a canine therapist that specializes in veterinary physiotherapy, rehabilitation, um, hydrotherapy, aquatic therapy, um, and canine and positive canine solutions in the clinical context. So that's where I'm looking from my, my niche. So it's gonna really depend on the service that you provide. And we discussed that in session one. So if you've not seen session one, you can look at the replay with that, but this is building on there. So who loves boxers? Lovely boxer there, beautiful brindle. Anybody in the house a boxer lover? It's all gone quiet at my end, so I hope I'm speaking to people. I can see how many people are live. I can see all your names, so I know who's out there. Some of you have checked in, so please do use the chat box. Let me know if you've got some policies and protocols in place and you want to discuss them. Let me know if you want to understand how to develop them further. I'm just gonna check the poll and have a little look at that. So how are we doing on the poll? So that's great. No one here is saying they've got fully developed policies. And, and if you have, there's always something to learn and move forward from. Um, a few people would like to develop their canine policies further, which is great because if you want some templates and support with that, I can provide that. And lots of people starting to develop them. So a lot of you are starting to develop the framework that is going to support your business and make it sustainable. And what's fantastic is research has shown that your sustainability is directly linked to your healthcare management. So we're going to discuss that in a little while. So to keep voting, please, on the poll, that's great. Just giving me an idea of um, what we can discuss this evening. So looking at this slide here, we've got clinical practice. It's assessment driven. It uses clinical reasoning and strategies. So I want to just discuss what the word strategies means in a clinical context. And these are high level planning to achieve your SMART goal setting for each canine patient in your professional care. So you are going to devise an individual program for each dog and owner that comes into your center, or you may be a mobile therapist as well. So again, it's gonna be that devising that individual program for them. And you're going to do that through a systematic, um, critically thought out um, plan where you are going to gather information. You are then going to analyze that information because you're gonna build that problem list or needs list. You want to prioritize your problem list and then from there, you can set your SMART goals. And your SMART goals are going to be short-term, mid-term, and long-term. And your SMART goals are going to be very, very useful for you to then establish what treatment techniques you are going to use and employ for that particular case, for that particular dog, with their specific needs, their specific behaviors in the clinical environment, and, and um, to support the owner as well. So everybody out there, are you using your assessment driven processes? Are you looking at developing your assessment um, processes or do you feel you've got those in place? And, and, and do you tend to use a problem list or do you call it a needs list? So I'm kind of a very positive person. So I like to call it a needs list and I look at people's um, needs rather than weaknesses. Um, and, 
and I sort of plan in a positive way, but a lot of, a lot of education uses the word problemless, but I try and look at it slightly differently. So if you're using an assessment driven process, do say hi in the chat room. Let me know if you're using SMART goals. Is every com everybody comfortable that they know what SMART represents, what it stands for as well? Because I can go through that if you would like. So just let me know if you want a quick review or refresher of SMART goals in canine therapy. So SMART goal setting comes up in lots of different businesses, but it's very specific for clinical practice. So if you want a reminder of what SMART stands for, just let me know and I can go through that for you. So from your goal setting, you can then move on and choose your treatment techniques. And we are so overwhelmed with social media. It influences us massively, whether we like it or not. Advertising is a very powerful tool and medium. Um, and we get very influenced by things we see and a few statements that are made about that. So I want to discuss that because there are so many ways to do the same thing. But your practice ethos will establish whether you are a dog-centric, animal-focused practitioner. Um, and that's the message that owners really want to hear and that you're species specific. So if you do more than one species, great for you, but it's really important that you're very species specific in your treatment techniques. Because what will work for humans will not work for dogs and what will work for horses will not work for dogs and what will work for cats will not work for dogs. So you want to choose the best treatment technique package for that dog to make the best progress. So that's really exciting. Everybody okay with SMART? So we won't go through that if you're all right with that. So just remember the SMART goal setting does not relate to other businesses. It's specific for canine therapy. So if you want a quick review of what SMART, S-M-A-R-T, just tell me in the chat room. Nothing's coming up on the chat. So I'm hoping I'm connected and I'm still live and not chatting to myself. Do say hi. So the SMART goals are a fundamental part of rehabilitation with dogs. They're a formal process to direct rehabilitation strategies towards a specific outcome. They can be used to evaluate success of the treatment as well. And they're fully supported by research. So please, when you're doing your goal setting, make sure that you're using this system because research um, supports how valuable. Thank you, Sarah, still live, that's great. It's a Sunday evening. You might all be having a fantastic barbecue or sharing drinks with friends and have just popped out. So it's not the most scintillating topic um, hi, Amandine. Great to see you. Welcome. Um, but it's really important for your longevity and your success for your business. So people tell me, how is it you built your practice at Canine HS in the middle of nowhere? Thank you, Vicky. Of course, I can go over it. I'd be delighted just to refresh and review it. Um, and Canine HS in the middle of nowhere, super rural. I was told I wouldn't last a year with no database and no one in that area knew me. It wasn't the area I was practicing in. And how are we such a successful practice? We're totally oversubscribed every day of the year we're open and I give away practice every single day. And it's a, it's a pressure, it really is. And so how has that happened? It's because I've always had my policies in place. And so from my educational background with canine HS courses, delivering courses and through um, working at the Royal Veterinary College, building up their clinical um, prospectus and their manual, then delivering the small animal rehab PG cert at Nottingham Vet School. And then with my liaison and being one of the two specialists in the UK for canine um, hydrotherapy, building the suite of canine hydrotherapy um, qualifications to give people more options, to give you progression from the level three. It's always been, I have got loads of policies in place, but they didn't come all together at the beginning. They were built over time and they evolved. And it, it's really helpful because it gives your business a real structure to see where you're going forward. Thank you, Bernadette. Caroline, thank you. From South Africa, amazing, worldwide, welcome. Great to see you. Okay, so Vicky, I know you're not the only one, but thank you so much for saying that because honestly, I have to remember there's so many different smart, goals out there in different businesses. I have to always kind of focus on the canine therapy ones. So S is for specific. 
We are specific in our approach to each dog in our care. We devise a specific program. Um, M is measurable. It's got to be measurable. And if you're going to do something measurable, it's got to be dog focused and dog centric. Just using an objective, supposed objective measurable tool that the dog can't cope with isn't appropriate anymore. We want the dog to work actively with us to build that professional bond of trust and confidence so we get reliable measurements. A dog that goes is stoic or goes into shutdown while you do a procedure because you've been told this is how you measure something, look for another option. There's always so many ways to do something. And, and in physiotherapy, in our world of physiotherapy, human physiotherapy, measuring with goniometry and measuring tape measures on the thighs is so old school now. We've moved on and it's very functionally orientated. So we're looking at functional measurements that are relevant to the dog's quality of life and functional measurements that are really relevant and important to the owner. So, you know, look up and read up on that. And if you want a little bit more information, um, about that, I can do that in another presentation. So A is for achievable. It's got to be achievable for the dog, not for you, for the dog. So if you're using a goal, um, you're, you've got a goal setted um, sort of um, strategy and it's not working for the dog, then you need to change it. You need to set your dog up so everything is achievable, um, short term, mid term and long term. It's really important because with that comes the confidence of the dog trusting you, doing some very unusual tasks with them, whether you're working water or on land, and building that bond where they'll actively decide to work with you. And if you read magazines, if you read the literature and, and books may be a little bit older, the books, they will suggest this isn't possible in canine therapy. We've been doing it for 20 years where the dog works with us. And it's like a bond that we work together and we're connected together. That actively mediated conscious decision means that activity is now proprioceptively enriched. So by getting the dog to work with you, rather than the dog allowing you to work on them, you've already made your strategy, your treatment, proprioceptively enriched. And if you're not sure what that means, check out the dogs in motion, because if you've got a proprioceptively enriched um, strategy, you are going to improve that dog's movement significantly. So R is for relevant. This is really important. Dogs are designed to move forward in a straight line. We know biomechanically how dogs are designed. Again, check out the dogs in motion, um, in, in balance motion, crowdcast. It's free. It's on my resource page. It's on replay. We're going to be developing them more and giving you more free um, resources with each crowdcast as well. So I'm really excited how that's going. It takes a while with the IT, but we'll get there. And um, relevant is about what is relevant for the dog. So when your dog comes running up to you, do they run backwards or do they run forwards? Have you ever seen a dog chasing a ball backwards? Have you ever seen a dog doing anything backwards apart from maybe a trained technique or maybe a maneuver? So think of your car, it, it drives forwards down the motorway at speed, you don't drive backwards. Biomechanically, the dog is designed with loads of biomechanical models to move forward. So there is no place at all in any strategy at K9 HS, either in our courses or, or in our clinical, our specialist clinics for backward motion with a dog because it's not relevant to a dog's movement. So again, your decisions are gonna be based in science and fact. OK, and I think that's really important. I saw a social media quote. There was a dog moving backwards in the treadmill. And my first instinct was, where's the therapist? There was no therapist in the treadmill. And the dog was being made to walk backwards. And then the comment was, it's really good to make muscles that don't work often work. Well, all movement in dog, we know from research, 99% of the musculoskeletal system is working. What we don't want to do is choose a treatment technique to meet a goal that you set that is going to actually jeopardize the biomechanical model of the dog and backward movement does. But forward movement is really relevant to what the dog needs to do. The other thing with any kind of backward movement is if you've got an athletic dog and you're wanting to get speed forwards, backward motion, so there's, there's a little training um, thing that a lot of people do where the dog goes steps back, and yes, it's proprioceptively enriched, but what it does is it increases the vertical lift of the dog. And in top level, a vertical lift is gonna detract from your horizontal forward motion. 
And so with well intention, yes, it's proprioceptively enriched. Is it relevant for the dog to go faster? No, in actual fact, it will slow it down slightly. And maybe at lower levels, that, that's fine. But at high levels, you really want to be thinking through your treatment plan. So your treatment toolbox wants to incorporate techniques that are relevant and meet those relevant SMART goals. And the last one is T for timely. So T for timely means you need time-based goals, and that's really important. So that's where we have our short-term, mid-term, and long-term goals. So I hope that kind of, that little review just helps bring a little bit of focus onto um, your goal setting, which is really important as part of your policies for devising individual treatment programs for each dog in your care. So historically in canine hydrotherapy, let's jump to that example because it's a really interesting example. 10 years ago, the majority of people were pole, a rigid pole and collar a dog in a pool. They didn't get in the pool, okay? Thank you, Vicky, I'm great. It's, it's great to go through it. I tell you, I go through everything so many times because you know, I'm a slow learner and I, I have to keep reviewing it because then it all makes sense. Because we, we, when we're on courses, when you do CPD, there's so many different bits of information and sometimes I get bogged down by detail. And so I like to have the clarity. So I love to review my approaches and I use those policies to review and evolve them because recently, um, I think um, I can't remember which which crowdcast it was. It's quite funny. I was quite ill and I was shaking. I was shaking so much because I was running a temperature and the, the bench I was on was squeaking and you can hear it on the crowdcast. Um, and, and, and then unfortunately from that virus, I then got shingles. So I'm only just getting back to work. But what it did do was the positive side of that. It was gave me time to look at my business model, which I've evolved. And with that today, I've been looking at some of my policies. And that helps me keep evolving my business so I'm going forwards into delivering the service that I, I really want to. So your toolbox, your therapeutic treatment toolbox, you don't want it to have one or two techniques in it. And historically in canine hydrotherapy, people would use a pole and collar or try, try line a dog into the water and it would be kept in the water. And could you believe it? They talk about laps and testing it to time. And current practice has nothing to do with a dog doing laps around a pool. And it has nothing to do with time swims, okay? Current hydrotherapy is so exciting, aquatic therapy. It's de designing a specific program for each dog and incorporating guided sequences in water with static work in water and dynamic work in water, getting amazing results in just a few sessions. So it's so exciting how it's moved on from there. And the treadmill, people would again be dangling a lead over the treadmill and they wouldn't get in. Current work in the treadmill, you know you're going to be in there with your hands on the dog administering your treatment techniques, whether they're alignment or proprioceptive pore placement, you're going to be doing your static work, your, your um, balance work, balancing the dog in its natural balance, not using training techniques because we're therapists, not trainers. And we know from research that that uses the wrong part of the brain. So we want to hook into how a dog is designed to move in natural balance because we're trying to improve the quality of its movement and functionality. So your therapeutic treatment um, toolbox is going to be guided and that's going to be guided by your code of practice with the professional associations like IRVAP, the Institute of Registered Veterinary and Animal Physiotherapists. Um, and they have a code of practice and then within that, you're gonna stay in your scope of practice. So looking at the people here today, you're, you're, you know, we're all on our career journey and you've all got different skills. So it's fantastic. Each one of you have a very specific niche business and um, uh, providing a service. And through that service, with your practice ethos and your species specific work, you are going to be developing your policies and, and protocols, but also abiding by your professional association, the code of practice and scope of practice. And what that does, these guidelines, they help you deliver safe and current practice that is clinically beneficial to the dog. And it's so exciting to see the rapid changes we see in dogs using current hydrotherapy and current physiotherapy. So it's very exciting times. I just love this um, picture um, that you're looking at. It's a fantastic dog um, who's very dear to me. And he is manic. He is fabulous and he is busy. And to get him to sit 
for those few seconds to get that shot, I can tell you, we sweated, but it's worth it because it's a super picture. And it's just showing you that your toolbox isn't necessarily, because there's not a pair of hands in there, your toolbox is not necessarily just the equipment you use. Your toolbox are all the different skills that you evolve and develop and evolve over time. So legislation, let's look at that because I have heard therapists saying, oh, well, all I need to do is a bit of water management and first aid. It's so much more than that. You have got legislation and we have, we have got to work within the UK um, legal framework. And for those of you joining me from abroad, you will definitely have your legislation that you will be guided by in the country, whether it's in America or Canada, New Zealand, hopefully someone from New Zealand's out there watching, but I know it's early in the morning for them. Um, Australia, um, in Asia as well, um, we've got people from France and Spain and lovely Ireland, which I have a great affinity with, um, as well as all over the UK. So it's really exciting to reach so many people that share a passion for canine therapy and want to see how we can make sure our businesses are sustainable and really successful. So your legislation is huge, and this is just like a snapshot of it for you. Um, and it's definitely something you've got to think about incorporating. And a lot of these need policies and you need some statements in place to make sure you're abiding by them. So I don't feel just a verbal policy is enough now. I really do feel you need to write your policies out. So if you would like any help with templates, if you're interested in having any kind of support for developing policies, let me know in the chat box because that kind of gives me an idea that that might be something we can add to the resource on the Crowdcast page for you to dip in. Hi, Kate. Welcome. Where are you from, Kate? Just remind me. I know lots of lovely Kate, so I'd like to know which Kate it is. Where are you based, Kate? I'll wait for the answer. There's always a delay. Just moves to slide. She'll be coming through. Okay, so research. Research is really important because there's an abundance of research out there, but it's not maybe all in one place for you to find. So I've kind of brought it together when it relates to policies and procedures. Research New Zealand, Kate, not Kate from New Zealand on our level three, hopefully. Welcome. Good morning to you. How are you? So um, research highlights the importance of healthcare policies and procedures. And what they do is provide standardization in daily activities. And this was really highlighted on a very popular program on TV in the UK. And it was a particular person from a very well-known family who went round different hotels and had a look at the different hotels and went into them to try and help them move forward, to help them be more successful because they were struggling with their business. And her key message that comes through over and over again echoes research that the consistency of your um, service that you provide is absolutely paramount for your business. It, there's no good you being brilliant on a Monday and pretty good on a Wednesday, but Friday morning, not being able to deliver that consistent service or that people know on a Thursday afternoon when you've got a packed clinic and you push somebody else in and you're really pushed, that they're feeling they're not maybe getting the service they got the time before. So consistency in your clinical, hi Kate. Yeah, in your, so consistency in your clinical practice is really important for your success. But this goes one step further. It's about standardizing all your daily activities in your practice, including your management practice. I'm sorry, I get distracted because I'm trying out of one eye to read the chat box because normally, People doing these presentations have someone who reads the chat box, someone who reads the questions, somebody who does the IT, and it's just me. And I'm with IT stuff, and those who know me know IT is a bit of my, my mountain that I'm still climbing. I've been on a long course for a few years, and it's coming on. I've got great mentors. But, you know, my most nerve-wracking thing about doing these talks for free to share information is always the IT. And, yes, I had my IT moment again today, but I'm hoping it's all going well your end. So research highlights the importance of management in healthcare services particularly. This is hugely supported by robust research. There is a very positive link between your clinical and your economic performance. Um, and this is, this is proven. So your clinical service that you provide link directly to your economic um, 
sustainability. And also we know that protocols and policies and having um, healthcare policies in place influences the quality of care. That is absolutely unrefuted. But what's interesting, it also influences the, the sustainability of the service. So for me, working in education, having worked in the university systems for about 15 years, teaching and lecturing and being an examiner, and now working with caninehscourses.com and ABC Awards that have an amazing hydrotherapy suite of qualifications, which we're developing, that reflects current practice, not practice from 10 years ago or five years ago, but current practice. So very exciting. The new level three is out, um, and it's in language that's really user-friendly, and it really reflects you know, what's going on this year in hydrotherapy. And we've got the new level four coming out in September. And that's going to be so exciting. It's going to be modular and it's going to give people the opportunity to sort of snatch little modules that are really relevant to their business without having to do the whole award straight away. So that level four diploma is going to be a very exciting thing for canine hydrotherapists who want to really explore advanced treatment techniques in the hydrotherapy pool or um, looking at water management solutions, you know, specifically for canine hydrotherapists, rather than water solutions for people who use swimming pools, which is slightly different. So that's going to be a really exciting thing. Um, and with that, that will influence the quality of your care because we're all on a career journey. We never get to a destination. We need to enjoy our journey and we need to like these crowdcasts, sharing information. We need to support each other on the journey as well because canine therapists are without doubt an incredibly hardworking group of individuals. We work really long hours and it can be really lonely and hard with your business at times. And so having this kind of support where we can share and that's what we're launching with IRVAP. It's um, a professional association I'm now delighted and honored to be the chair of. I'm going to be launching free resources for canine therapists, equine therapists, canine hydrotherapists that they can access like an information hub on the, on the new website that we hope to launch at the end of August. It's really, really exciting. And they're open to everybody, not just members, everybody. Because by sharing and exploring ideas and having conversations, we can go forward and develop our practice. What really alarms me on social media is when you see a picture of a dog on a surfboard, and I know the history and background where that's come from, and then hear people saying that they do that, because I would never, ever put a dog on a surfboard as part of canine hydrotherapy, and I've got underpinning knowledge and research to support that decision, okay? And so I've used a systematic, critical thinking pathway to make that decision. It's not an emotional decision. It's based on fact and research. It, the, the surfboard techniques came from human practice. They are not appropriate for canine therapy because it's going to be predominantly reflexive movements that you initiate. And we know from research that reflexes are about protecting the dog. It's about the dog reacting to that reflex in a protective manner. That is not that useful for the dog to improve its movement. What is incredibly improve, in, in, um, effective is using a rhythmical balance technique, like rhythmical stabilizations. And that's, again, if you're not sure about this, go and check out the dogs in natural balance motion. It explains the function of the CPGs. And CPGs give out a rhythmic output, and gait is a rhythmic output. So you want to opt for rhythmic output, rhythmical treatment techniques, rhythmical balance techniques, and use the body of water, which is a beautiful, warm, lovely cushion of proprioceptive loveliness, and use the subtle qualities of the water with your treatment techniques to, to deliver the most amazing balance movements and techniques. Whereas the surfboard, you've got the danger of a flipping, you've got to hold it in place, the dogs go into extensor um, thrust to maintain that, the behaviors on the dogs, getting on and off the boards and being on the boards, that's not part of canine therapy for me. So, you know, everybody's um, entitled to choose their own techniques, but I would never opt to do that. I would never train anyone to do that. I would ne if I see it, I will say out loud, that's not appropriate for safe practice because of the injuries and dangers that HIT has, has caused and are documented. 
the number of times a dog has come off that board suddenly because it's flipped out from underneath them. But apart from that, using a reflexive treatment technique, we know from research it's not appropriate for the dog. And you're going to have to do a lot more of that to make a difference. Whereas by doing one appropriate treatment technique where you engage the dog's core, using the warm water, using a balance um, movement that engages the core, you're going to get the most fantastic results in that session. And they will have longevity because you're hooking into how the dog's designed to move, not how the dog is designed to protect itself. So two really different things to think about. And that, Dave Taylor, was particularly for you because you have hassled me today. And over the week, we had like messages about it. I went online to social media and have to say, I was so alarmed at that and the comments you know, there's so many people who realize the dangers of it, but there's so many people who will see that and think that's appropriate. So categorically, Canine NHS courses would never put a dog on a surfboard. And we've got research and facts to support that decision. And also categorically, we would never walk a dog backwards and definitely never have a dog in a treadmill without being in there with our hands on the dogs. Um, because, again, the research supports it's not beneficial to the dog when there's so many other amazing ways to do that. Thank you, Dave. You're very quiet tonight, I have to say, Dave. You're behaving yourself. So let's have a little look at the next slide. I hope you're loving the dog faces that I've picked up for, um, for this. I love this dog, so wonderful. So what's an operational manual? Everybody I've asked to build an operational manual in all the courses at level seven, level six, level five, all the courses I've delivered find it tedious. They moan, they say, oh, and it is. It is a little bit brain numbing. However, once it's in place, the difference it's made to everybody's practice has been phenomenal. So it's kind of one of those tasks you need to get through. Dodgy internet, oops. What, I've got dodgy internet, Dave, or you've got dodgy internet? Can everybody hear me? It could be your end. I've got so much super duper Wi-Fi here. I should be fine. Can everybody else hear me? I've got a lot of people watching. Can somebody say yes? Can you see me and hear me? I may have gone offline, who knows? I'll keep going. Anyway, operational manuals. Amandine, great. I've got you in my audience, it's worth it. Yay, Sarah, still there, hanging in there. Great, fantastic. So the operational manual, it is tedious. It is also an amazing tool for you to build for your practice. So imagine that you want to go on holiday and you would like me to come in and run your center for you. I would like your operational manual. So in the operational manual, literally every activity that you do should be documented in the sequence that you know time wise really works for you. OK, so these kind of documents are living documents because you're going to keep tweaking it as you try things out. But basically, it provides guidance for your team to perform the everyday tasks efficiently and correctly. And efficiently is so important. And I think we've got one of the questions. We've only got two questions, so please ask away. I'm just going to pop to a question here. Bernadette, love it. Right, start answering. I'm going to timestamp it and try and get this right without support. So do you think therapists should have self-care policies? Absolutely. Every centre, you need to have policies that look after yourself, your self-care. You have spent a huge amount of money investing in developing your clinical skills. You have studied hard. You are committed as a professional to doing CPD and courses every year to progress your, your standards and your service. You are on a journey and you should enjoy the journey, not be threatened by it. Not pretend at level three, you've got it all there. Not pretend at level seven, you've got it all there. We're all on a journey together. It's really exciting. It's really great if we can support each other, share ideas, have conversations, rather than being influenced by social media posts and a, and a, a comment by someone with no underpinning references or support to that, which throws people's confidence because we get tired. And what we do is we get tired because it's a physical job, what we do. And it's also an emotionally draining job. And it's a, a commitment. Everybody who works in canine therapy, when you're working with animals, it's a huge commitment to delivering the best service you can. And if you don't look after yourself, who is gonna look after your wonderful dogs you've got booked in on your diary tomorrow and next week and the month after? And I've really realized that as well. 
from being so ill for several for several weeks you know the the, the it jeopardized the clinics because I am not looking after myself and adjusting my workflow to adjust for my my age as I'm getting a bit older, my physical stresses and the fact that I do so many other things. So I'm just cramming a little bit. So it's been great for me to sit back and like review what's my business model? What are my policies? Look at the policies and look at them. So self-care policies are absolutely so vital. I have physiotherapy for my injuries. I have physiotherapy to maintain my flexibility and physicality so I can deliver the clinical side of the job, as well as do the traveling and the lecturing, as well as being at the desk developing the online courses. So each of those demands self-care. Diary management is absolutely key to your safe practice. Squashing in another couple for a little bit more money is not worth it when it jeopardizes you and it jeopardizes the quality of the service you're providing and also puts the animals in your service at risk as so many therapists over so many years have told me when they've pushed themselves and just pushed themselves that little bit more, seen another animal, squashed it in, that's when they've either been bitten or had a behavior or it's not gone well, it's not flowed well and they know that their servant wasn't consistent. It wasn't at the level that they normally deliver it at. So yes, I think that's such an important thing, Bernadette, and I would love to work with you to sort of see how we could do something specifically for canine hydrotherapists because it's a very unique role that we have. So if you're up for that, Bernadette, let me know. Okay, second question. Oh, it's Tracy. Tracy, thank you so much. Tracy Clark, I can see and hear you. Thank you very much, brilliant answer that. So any more questions, please post them at the bottom. I'm just going to check out the poll. So I'm starting to develop my policies and looking for guidance is quite a lot of the votes. So um, that's something that if you're interested in, let me know in the chat box if you would like some support in some templates or some, you know, key things where we could share some templates together. Definitely Bernadette to templates or definitely to working with me for self-care for, um, um, therapists, or maybe both. Okay, so the documentation, it identifies the approved standard procedures for performing your operations safely to provide your service. So it relates to your gas boiler and your operational services, how to use your equipment, how to use your electrotherapy equipment, but also your operational manual is your day-to-day -day tasks, how you open up your center, how you close it down, how you do your water management, right down to the procedure of backwashing. Now, has anybody here ever been so tired at the end of the day, they lock the door on the clinic and they go home and they go, did I lock it? And go back and check. Or you go into the plant room and you do a procedure and you come out and you don't quite remember all the processes because you've gone into your, you've gone into your proprioceptive level of learning that's not conscious. You've gone into your unconscious proprioceptive learning. You have not gone to sleep. However, when that moment arises in your cortex and you go, did I do that task? You go and check it again, all right? So whether you do backwash day in, day out, it's so helpful to have a visual um, procedure stuck upon your wall above it. So when you're very tired, you can look up there and it gives you a bit of a, a, um, a clue or just a reminder, even though you've done it a hundred times before, a thousand times before, and so that's really important in making that efficient because it is not efficient for me to drive down the drive and then have to go back and check the door to make sure I've locked it or I've locked all the windows. So any kind of closing down procedure, have it as a procedure. Any kind of opening up procedure, have it as a procedure, as well as um, your deep cleans, your infection control policies and procedures, documenting all of those and building them up over time really adds a huge value to your sustainability of a business. It's absolutely a key thing, seriously. So, but it is tedious, but when you do it, it's wonderful afterwards. So developing your policies, let's think about how we can develop policies. First of all, you need to identify the need. The last thing you want to do is develop a policy for the sake of it. You need to develop a policy because you need it. OK, and then identify who is going to take lead responsibility. So if you are a lone practitioner and you think you have no one in your team, 
I'm not sure. You might have someone that helps you with your website. You might have an accountant. You might have a, par a partner who has um, a job in some other area that could bring that there. So again, don't always go to you to do everything. Identify who can take that lead responsibility and use people's skills around you in your network to help you. So you don't feel like you're having to do that to the detriment of delivering your service. And then gather information. So again, you might have to write the policy because you're insightful about your practice, but you could get someone else to do the research. They could go out there and look at the information out there and gather it in for you. And then you've got that and you can put that all on one side and start processing through it. And then you want to draft a policy. And there's loads of templates online. I've got a lot of templates I'm really happy to share with you as well that would be half filled out. Um, relevant to canine therapy, obviously. So if you want to do it for something else, you need to go and source them yourself. But if you want something about canine therapy, I'm really happy if you want me to share them with you, to share them through um, our Canine HS resources page. And then draft that policy up. And then you're going to consult with the people it involves. So you want to consult with your stakeholders. And you can, by doing a scoping exercise, consult with your owners, your MDT team, your own network, have a chat with people because they've got so many useful perspectives that you can use to help develop it. And then finalize and approve the policy. And the policy, you really need to start thinking, do you need procedures? So is it a policy that sits alone in your file as a living document? Or is it a policy that you now need to develop the procedures and they need to be in place and they're required? as in your infection control. And then you want to implement it. And the most important thing is then not to file it and leave it alone. You put it in your file and you need to say, when's your review date? So it might be in a year's time, it might be in three months time, six months time. You need to sign it and date it, and then you need to take it out and update it. Because every time your business evolves, there will be something else that you can add into it or tweak it or You've run your policies and you've found actually you've evolved slightly and you, you're taking a slightly different journey with it somewhere else. So um, that's developing your policies. It's a really good bullet list to kind of um, jot down or look at and copy and um, use to start building. Just start building one and they grow from there. Right. So let's look at stages. The first thing is awesome photo. Love this dog. Um, identify the need. Do not develop a policy for the sake of it or because someone on social media has told you you should have it. If you want to think about some of the policies that you feel you should have in place, I'm really happy to say like my essential five would be, I'm very happy to go through that, but I'm not here to kind of preach, you have to have this, you have to have that. This is about a discussion to share information for you to then decide what you need for your business. But again, like the SMART goals, if you want me to just kind of highlight like, the first five that come off my head that I would be thinking are really crucial for safe practice and for a great framework for your business um, to evolve and develop from. I'm really happy to share that now online with you. If you want to email me later, you can as well. It's no problem at all. Um, so, you know, let, let's 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 be open and share because we've got a lot of kind of secretive um sort of like approaches with people where, well, I do this, but I don't share it. If we all share and support each other, the best thing about all of that is the dog gets a better deal. And that for, is what it's all about. It's all about the dog. It's all about the owner. Um, and it's all about us all raising our standards together. My top five policies. Vicky, I'm loving you because you are participating. I have all the time in the world for you, my friends. OK, so first of all, with GDPR, you have to have a privacy policy. You have to have, if you've got a website page, Facebook page, you need a privacy policy, you're dealing with information um, and you've got to have your privacy policy in place and you need terms and conditions. They're my first two. I'll come back to a few more. So privacy policy and terms and conditions. And terms and conditions, when you read other people's on the websites are a great place to start. Some of them are like a little bit stroppy and kind of like a little bit scary. I try, look at my terms and conditions on my website. I try and make them really like friendly like, you know, your dog's jumping around and being really wonderful. Can you keep it on the lead, please? Because another dog leaving the center, that lovely, friendly behavior isn't going to work for that dog. So, you know, that that kind of thing. So wording and being friendly and approachable like Irvap's new website is going to be amazing because it's all about building a community of people who share a passion and a love for canine therapy, equine therapy, 
feline therapy, any animal therapist out there, veterinary physiotherapists, canine hydrotherapists, canine massage therapists, veterinary surgeons who have got multi-qualifications. It's really interesting with Herbap, the community is made of people with multi-qualifications. These are professionals that also have qualifications in animal therapy. And so this community is really diverse and I love being involved with this diverse group of people because with that comes a great strength that we're offering such a unique um, opportunity for animal therapists to evolve, but also being an information hub for owners, for the public, for other therapists who maybe aren't getting the support with the free PDFs that we're going to be offering. So, you know, do check out the new website in September when it goes live. Um, my other five top policies, you have to, you have to have a general health and safety policy. If you've got a canine center and if you're doing anything with hydrotherapy, you must have a general health and safety policy or statement that you sign and date and check. And it must be a commitment to what you are offering as a professional. That's three, I'm just under pressure, they're coming out. Okay, but that's really important. I believe in a diverse community is an enriched community and sharing and evolving and supporting each other. So I have uh, equality, equality and diversity policy. Now, I know a lot of centers don't have them. I do know that and I appreciate that. But for me, it's paramount. Uh, diversity is our richness and it's um, our strength. And you need an equality and diversity and policy to show that you are embracing those acts which are in the legislation. So that's four. I'm kind of getting to the fifth one in a moment. I don't want to miss one out. And then you go, oh, you haven't mentioned this. So definitely as a hydrotherapist, if you're working with water, your infection control policy is top of the pops. It's so important. It's not something to miss out. And it's not something to just do ad hoc from notes from a course. You need a policy. You need to understand your biosecurity. You need to be offering a safe place for those dogs to work in. And that's really, really important. That isn't covered by having your water tested externally once a month. That's just an extra and any biochemist bio, um, will be able to argue the robustness of that. You need an infection control policy for your day-to-day -day practice. That's really important, especially this time of the year. Do you know how many swimming pools develop a population of bacteria this time of the year? You'd be stunned, okay? And you want to keep your population at zero or a very, very small controlled population. So, um, really important in this hot weather as well. So continually assess your activities. If your model, business model like ours is changing, um, look at your responsibilities, look at the external environment, identify the needs for your policies and procedures. They're gonna be really unique to you. Oh, Jeanette, brilliant question. Could I possibly ask you, just while I go to the next slide, can you possibly copy and paste or put that in ask a question? Because I'm really worried if other people come into the chat box, Jeanette, I'll miss that question because I want to answer that because I think that's a brilliant question. Right, so moving on to policy development stages, you need to, um, who is gonna take the lead responsibility and delegate? Delegating is really hard for me um, because only I can clean the toilet as well as I can. No, seriously, delegation is really hard for some people. So to delegate is really important to recognize other people's expertise. So if I've got someone in my team or someone in my network that has got a more developed expertise, I am definitely gonna to delegate to them rather than trying to do my best version. Um, and gather information, look at your legal responsibility. So absolutely, animal therapists, we have to work within the UK legislation and that includes having a written and signed referral for every single animal that you treat, okay? I don't think there's anywhere to stand for verbal referrals anymore. You want a written and signed dated referral from your vet saying they agree to you treating that animal. You're working within the Veterinary Surgeons Act. Perspectives and reading the law and interpreting the law are very open, but that's where I sit. We would not see an animal at Canine HS, whether it's my friends, one of my own, I want a written referral. And I want the vets to know that so they've got the confidence in referring to us as well. And that's really important. Confidence, confidence of the dog, working with you using therapeutic handling, confidence of the owner in you, because they love the way that you bond and work with your dog in that professional manner. Confidence in the vets in your practice because their owners are so thrilled and delighted with the amazing progress you make with a neuro case in one or two sessions and they can't believe it. 
So that confidence is a very key part of your sustainable future um, delivering animal therapy or canine animal therapy, I should say, canine therapy. So yes, gathering information, what are your legal responsibilities? Do you understand accurate and up-to-date information? So you want to look at the, the most recent legal um, statements, policies, acts, amendments, and refer to those. And then you need to interpret them into canine therapy. So um, when they're just set out there for animal therapy, you need to then take it into your specific, your specific species and look at that and analyze that. Um, where do you go for guidance? And there's so many places. I've just had a few therapists recently that I know very well from ooh, 20, 23 years, 24 years, ask me about quite straightforward questions about policies, about water management, and they weren't aware where they could go for guidance. And there's so much out there from the government. There's so much out there in the literature. So again, if you haven't got those resources to hand, let me know. And then thank you, Jeanette. I will go to that question in a moment. Um, let me know and, and I will share you know, some, some um, references and I can share some of these links with you on the Crowdcast page, on the resource page, because you should all have those at your fingertips. It shouldn't be I only have them because I've taught at university level for however many years and other people don't have it. It's about sharing this information so we can all offer amazing services to the dogs in our care. And then also access to existing templates. It's called writing big. It's not cheating. You get a template, it's half filled out, and you put your version into it. And I'm very happy to share my templates that are half written or complete that you can kind of customize, put your logo on. As long as you're professional, professional about it and say courtesy of K9HS, I'm really happy to do that. Um, as a professional, we all want to work together and support each other. Sandra Spring, yes, please send the resources. Well, they won't be sent, Sandra. What they'll do, they'll be added to the Crowdcast pages, which we're developing, but I will definitely start putting some on then if you feel that would be useful. Okay, so um, policy, um, your developmental stages, we've got to drafting. So use term terminolo terminology, sorry, use terminology appropriate to the people who are gonna be using it with you. So don't use terminology exclusively. So if you use words or terminology that excludes the people that are gonna use that policy, that isn't gonna be communicating um, in a positive and helpful way. So use your terminology to be inclusive. And again, IRVAP is an inclusive organization that is nurturing a diverse community of therapists, but they all have multi-qualifications or qualifications. So our categories in IRVAP have particular or specific admissions policy for each category. And that assures the insurance companies, it assures other professionals, it ensures, assures the public that you're gonna get a highly qualified professional working within that category. And that's where you bring a diverse community together. And this is what this is all about. This is about reaching people all over the world, practicing and having the best job in the world working with dogs and enjoying their, their job and wanting to sustain it. So these policies and protocols are a huge step forward to making sure that you've got longevity. It's tragic when you look at the actual figures, how many canine hydrotherapy centers and how many canine therapy centers close down after two years. They're not sustainable. So we want to make sure we build a great framework for your business and that you have longevity and you take forward a dog-centric practice ethos because the more people that work with the dogs rather than on the dogs, the more other people will be influenced by, by that as well. So consultation, effective policies are always inclusive and they're always supportive. Policies are not to tell people off. If you get an email from an organization and it feels like it's telling you off, why are you a member of it? You really need to value your organizations you associate with. So we want them to be supportive and we want them to be inclusive these policies will then really empower your practice. And then finalize and approve the policy. So don't leave it in draft, finalize it and approve it. And then that's the moment you think, do I need a procedure in place to be able to action this policy in my business? So it's a very um, systematic, critically thought out, logical process. And this framework gives robustness to your business and will definitely lead to your successes. And so then implement. No point having a policy if you don't implement it. So implementation, 
who is it going to be community, um, communicated to, who is going to do the communication, make sure it's out there, it's reviewed and everyone. So this is where you need to have training days. This is where you need to take time out to think about your business and how you're going to actually um, implement them into your business if you're a lone practitioner. This is where you need time to think about your business, your strategies, your practice ethos, your policies. And in session three, extra exciting things to make sure your business is successful. So you can then deliver the amazing clinical service you want to, to the dogs in your care. And then most importantly, so many people write amazing policies and then they go locked away. You need to review them and update them. So you want to monitor them, assess them, assess the usage of the policy, set a review and a revision date, and then set that aside and put that time in. And so if you start with a few policies and build it from there, that, that is such a useful way if it's something new to you or you're just starting to develop your policies. Otherwise, you'll be overwhelmed. Um, so look at the legislative policies you have to abide by. You've got your Veterinary Surgeons Act. You've got your um, General Health and Safety. You've got COSH. You've got RIDOR. You've got Electricity at Work. If you've got a centre, look at all that legislation and build in your policies and, um, and group those into those policies and, and make sure. And you've also got policies about um, visitors coming into your um, center. You'll have policies about biosecurity, water management. So your policies will start building and over time have policies that you use. So policies that you don't use, lose them. You don't write a policy for the sake of it. You write it to empower your practice. So awesome picture of this dog. I love this dog so much. I know I keep saying that. And this dog loves its canine therapist, who's one of my amazing therapists on my team and who has done amazing things for this wonderful dog. Um, and so, um, again, it's all about the dog. And that's why you're here. That's why you're listening about this stuff, because it's all about building a practice that has sustainability, empowers your um, success, but more importantly, delivers a really high quality service that you niche and dominate in your area, which is what I want you to do. So I want you to be hugely successful and keep being successful. Remember, businesses like Blockbusters were hugely successful, but they didn't evolve with the times. They didn't embrace current therapeutic canine hydrotherapy. They didn't embrace current veterinary physiotherapy for dogs or rehabilitation techniques that are saying no to reflexive techniques and saying yes to rhythmical techniques that hook into the way the dog is actually designed to move. So your policies will evolve. And because blockbusters did not evolve or change or felt they were so dominant in the market, they folded. And we still got the blue and yellow buildings on lots of street corners in the UK. And it was great because in Captain Marvel, if you've watched it, she fell into one. You know, so they're archaic because they didn't evolve. And so you're going to be successful because you realize you need to evolve your business constantly. That's all right, Sandra. I'm going to share. Don't worry. So we've got another question here, which I saw was from Jeanette, which is brilliant. Just timestamp it. Do you only need these written down if you have more than one? So many people working at the center. So I think the legislation says with your risk assessments, if you look at risk assessment, Mm, one of my top five, and I think I've spilled over five, Vicky, but risk assessment, dynamic risk assessment, and your at leisure, your risk assessment of your center, absolutely paramount. Risk assessment and safe practice is what it's all about. Safety for you, safety for the owner, safety for the dog. And those all need different requirements to ensure that happens. So if there's under five people in your team, or in your network or in your management structure or whatever it is you, you call your, um, your practice, the people who work for you, apparently you don't have to write it down. Now, when I was home alone, the only person at Canine HS when I first opened, I had it written down. I had it written down when somebody joined me. I had it written down and then as I've built my team up to about 10 of us now and I've got satellite centers as well, which I highly value, I've got more satellite centers coming on board, so really exciting really exciting news. We're gonna have more areas where you can get um, geographically easy locations to pick up caninehscourses.com, practical sessions for those online courses, which is gonna be really exciting. They will all have access to the policies that are appropriate. So 
I think by writing it down, the actual process of gathering the information, building your draft, it empowers you to understand what that policy is all about, rather than just thinking it's a piece of um, writing to put in a file and file away. It's actually something that's the framework of your business that is going to help you be sustainable, achieve your goals and your dreams of offering a really high quality service to the dogs in your care for a long, long time and influence practice around you. And why not? Why not dominate and lead your center? Why not dominate and lead your county? Why not take therapeutic canine hydrotherapy and canine um, therapeutic canine veterinary physiotherapy and rehabilitation to a level no one else is delivering? OK, and, and I think that's what it's all about, really. So I hope that helps, Jeanette. But I, I absolutely would write everything down because the process of writing is a great learning um, way to kind of really reinforce it and see how does this work for me? How does this fit in with me? I'm not actually doing my biosecurity. I'm just firefighting and doing a bit of cleaning up each day. When's the day where you do your deep cleaning? When's the day when you do um, your semi deep cleaning? So, you know, making sure when's the day you sit down and write your policies? When's the day you do your report? So sewing it in with policies, procedures, protocols. So your policies are mandatory and your guidelines, your procedures, they may not be mandatory, they may be guidelines. So there's a difference between the two. So I think I've got one on the last slide. My favorite slide of all time, because this dog is super special. a soulmate of one of a very important person in my life. And um, really old dog who's doing so well. And uh, just love this dog. Love this slide because that's what it's all about, working with the dog, um, working together. The dog wishes to work with you consciously and decides it's going to work with you as a therapist. And you're working with the dog, respecting its behaviors and its responses in your clinical setting. So you get the most amazing outcomes. I, I'm still horrified and still shocked at a recent conference where someone stood up on, on stage a supposed canine therapist from, from abroad and said, scare the shit out of the dog and it will do what you want. I still can't believe that was presented at a conference. However, I still can't um, really get my head around that someone who doesn't do canine hydrotherapy was at a conference a few years ago and suggested putting dogs on surfboards and doesn't actually do the job. Um, and that horrified me because when you present something at a conference or a seminar, the audience will naturally think it's reinforced by those setting up the conference and presenting the conference. It's the ethos and the mindset. And so your framework of your practice ethos and your policies are going to ensure you make decisions for your practice that are in the dog's best interest, reflect current practice and will empower your, your choices. Please don't be swayed by a few comments on social media or a few pictures. You know, if they're somebody else is doing something, that doesn't mean necessarily that's useful for you to do. So make your own choices. I am not telling you what to do. I'm just sharing what we do. I'm sharing why we're so successful. I'm sharing why we're oversubscribed every day. And I'm sharing the techniques, the treatment techniques that we do with dogs that we get the most amazing results so much quicker than anywhere else. And that's because we're working with them with a professional bond and we're using proprioceptive enriched treatment techniques that we have critically thought out through our programming, including smart goal setting, and that hook in directly to how dogs organize their movements. So the biomechanics of the dog, the functional anatomy of the dog, the canine behaviors of the dog are so different to human, they're so different to equine, and understanding that, that each treatment technique is backed with fact and research is so important for you because then you can then hand on heart said, you know, well intention can cause problems, but you are as a therapeutic canine therapist doing the very best job for those dogs in your care, which is what we're all about. So it's brilliant. So I'm just having a look. I think I've got one more. I've done answering. Sorry, I don't think I did that. So that's gone on. Any more questions do put in there. We're going to check out the poll. Right. So Lots of people developing their policies. So it's really exciting times for you because you can decide how you want to evolve your business. Um, and you want to, and some people wanting to develop them further. So that's fantastic. You can relook at them and tweak them and evolve them to keep up to date with current practice. Um, if you found today useful, it's built on session one. 
please let me know in the chat box because we're going to start winding it up. If there's no more questions now, um, I, I'm just having a look. I've gone over my hour, so you get an hour CPD. We do have CPD certificates for those who would like them. If you can please um, give me um, a week to sort it out because um, for us, we just have a bit of IT. We can't produce the certificates tonight or the next few day, days. What we do when we give you free certificates, it costs me money um, and it's a complex IT program. And I want to do that. I want to give you certificates if you need them because I know how valuable they are for you, for your professional associations, but we can't do them instantly following. Thank you, Vicky. We can't do them instantly following the Crowdcast. We need a week because the IT behind it is really complicated because we have to do a new bit of workflow for every single Crowdcast. And we're amounting quite a few now. We sort of started off with a few as a little bit of a um, to see how it would go. And, um, you know, it's growing from there. It's been brilliant. So session three is going to finalize the business series. And I've got a real surprise for you with the business series. So I'm going to be giving you lots of new free resources and building that into a little mini course for you, which is great. Thank you, Vicky. I'm really, really pleased that you found it useful and um, great that you've come. And thank you so much for everybody. I'd also like to say a really special thank you to all the people who email me, thanking me for doing it. I really enjoy doing these apart from the IT stress. Um, thank you, Dave. Really nice to know that you found it useful. Again, just put in the chat box if you're finding this useful. Session three, and then we're going to hook back into a very exciting clinical topic after session three in September. So October is going to be something really special to watch out for. It's one of my great passions working with the older dog. Um, and I think you're going to find that very exciting. So we'll kind of ship back into clinical practice a little bit. But Again, if you um, have anything particular you want me to like look into and present to you and share with you, do let me know. Again, just let me know in the chat box if you found it useful. That really helps support our decision whether we're going to continue these after into next year, because I said I would do these for one year. Thank you, Jenny. Great that you found it useful. Um, hopefully, um, we can move forward and keep sharing, keep working together keep enjoying doing these together. So again, let me know if you found them useful. It is huge to me to um, get the feedback and that kind of drives me forward to think what else can we do? Um, thank you, Jeanette, really helpful. I'm just gonna say bye for now. Have a super weekend, enjoy the lovely weather, keep those dogs out of the hot weather, keep them cool. Great Olga to see you here. Really, really nice to have the thanks. Thank you, Caroline, that's really great. And um, I'm going to say bye for now, and we'll catch up in September. Enjoy your August. Keep those dogs cool. Keep them hydrated. Look after yourselves. And, yes, definitely self-care. Very, very important for every canine therapist because we need you um, 